Welcome back to Court TV Live on our continuing coverage of the state of Minnesota versus Derek Chauvin. The potential jurors and everybody else in the courthouse in Hennepin County are on a break, a much needed lunch break. Once they resume, we'll, of course, get you right back in to the courtroom with our cameras. Let's now pause and have our daily sidebar, which we look forward to every day. And there they are, Julie Grant, Court TV anchor, and Michael Ayala. Boy, guys, w w yesterday we were waiting for this moment, and we, it, jury selection is always different, right? Sometimes it is like watching paint dry, and, and we do it sometimes here on Court TV because we give you gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage, but this is fascinating. I mean, the, the audio quality is great. You can't see the jurors, but you can really get a feel for who they are. Let's start with Juror 8, the guy that uh, is being questioned right now. He is a conundrum to me. He uh, seems like a conservative guy. He likes Blue Lives Matter. He's suspect of Black Lives Matter. But he thinks Chauvin uh, absolutely used an Ill or was, was, was used excessive force, and he's sticking to that opinion. Uh, Julie, to you first, would you, would you take this guy if you were Chauvin in, in the defense team? If I'm on the defense side, I would not. And I would really try to continue the questioning to try to get him struck for cause. The one thing that I've walked away thinking this morning is there were a couple jurors there. I mean, the two that they burned their strikes on, I think if the questioning was more pointed, there possibly could have been a cause issued by the court to say, no, you just can't be fair for whatever reason, or no, perhaps there's too much of a language barrier in the case of juror number one. But it's it's like they're holding back. They're not really taking those steps forward. And I think you've got to if you're the defense. And I think if this juror number eight has already formed those opinions about the conduct of the defendant, if you're on the defense team, you don't take them. If you're on the side of the state, uh, you're going to be fine with that juror. Yeah. Um Michael, your opinion on eight, but two, also pick up on where Julie left off. I, juror one should have been bounced for cause, and I, I agree. If he'd have just answer, asked her complex questions, like four in a row, I mean, she didn't understand half of what they were asking. And uh, at some point, it would have gotten ridiculous, but he had to use a challenge. So your opinion on, on eight and, and uh, using the cause on, or the, the strike on one. Yeah, okay. First of all, number eight, as a defense attorney, I love him. Right? I, I'm going to take the opposite approach, only because he's a guy that's firmly in the camp that I want my juror to be in, doesn't like Black Lives Matter. And I believe he's a guy that would be open. Now, he initially, his initial impression of the tape, which I think is going to be universal, is that there was too much force used. But if, as a defense attorney, I do my job and I show him that what was done there was according to the rules, and according to the way law and order is supposed to be run in Minneapolis and show him why it was used, he's very open to saying, oh, I'm ready to change my mind. And he's a leader type. He's higher up in management. He's a guy that's going to be one of the people in control of that room. So I like him. Okay, I'm not, gonna, I'm not feeling too bad about him. Now, juror number one, I agree 100%. As I was listening, and at the time that that was going on, I was driving in in my car, and I'm saying, this person's lost. I'm like, why, why wouldn't they just continue on and just uh, show even more that they're not quite getting what's going on here? And you could have easily gotten them struck because. So I was, uh, I was definitely surprised by that. Yeah, I lean towards you with eight, too. I think he's got some potential uh, just because of his, the, anyone who's, who's, you know, black, blue lives matter all in and is suspect of black exactly. lives matter, you're not going to find too many of those. Um, exactly. Let's go to the one juror that is already on the panel. This is the chemist, the chemist camp counselor number two. Um, Julie, this guy um, had all the right answers, but he also seemed like one of those people that wants to be on the jury and was saying the things that he thought everybody wanted to hear. And the one thing that stood out to me is, is he claims he's never seen the video. Right. I'm, I'm with you. I think that was one thing that made everybody watching, listening this, you know, turn their head and go, wait, what did you just say there? And then he was very specific saying, I saw a still photograph. That definitely gave me pause, Ted, like it did you. The only thing I could think of, and I wish, again, I wish the attorney would have probed a little more, like, why not? Because that video has been so readily apparent, unless you're someone, and I know many people like this, many, you know, friends, loved ones who look at it and go, oh my gosh, I, I can't, I don't want to see this, this is so upsetting, it's deplorable what happened to George Floyd. I don't want to look at this video all the way through because it is so gut-wrenching to watch. If, if he would have offered something like that, then I would have thought, okay, this maybe makes a little bit of sense why he hasn't seen it otherwise. 
I, I, you know, again, it, it's, it's a little troubling because otherwise his answers were kind of like perfection for both sides. There was really nothing either side had a prayer with getting him struck for cause. So I see why this juror was chosen, and it, it does seem like he's going to be somebody who, uh, you know, will be will be fair, will be impartial. He seems like a pretty methodical guy, except for the fact that he says he didn't see the video. Right, and, and didn't tell his uh, fiance that uh, he was on the George Floyd case. It's like, all right, you didn't tell your wife. That's one thing. Your fiance, come on. <laughs> yeah, come on. Oh, just kidding. I tell my wife everything. The, uh, <laughs> but, Michael, your, your thoughts on two. He, um, he's a scientist, chemist, so he's going to be very analytical, one would think, but uh, also an environmentalist. Um, what's your take? I, I, it was going to be difficult to get him uh, for cause, right? Because he sort of, like you said, his answers were almost right down the middle, perfect. Like he wanted to be on the jury, had no problem with that. I, I don't know what that's about. But listening to him, I was extremely frustrated for a number of reasons. One, um, he says he hasn't seen the video. His city is burning, but he hasn't tried to figure out why his city is burning. He's 30 years old. The Internet is their life at 30 years old, right? That's the sort of millennial generation. They spend their life on the Internet. Nothing has come up on the Internet, just popped up in his, in his searches or anything about this case such that he was able to see the video, wasn't curious at all. But yet, but yet, he had the wherewithal to have enough of an opinion and, and a reasoned opinion as to why he didn't like the Black Lives Matter movement, but he liked Black Lives Matter, right, because all lives matter. Whew. This guy, I don't know. But you know what? <laughs> but who does he help? I mean, is, is he going to be pro-prosecution? or he, I, I think he's pro-defense. I honestly do. Hmm. I think he's a guy. Now, I have scientists in my family, so I, I know the tunnel vision that scientists can have sometimes and be oblivious to what's going on in the world, but not if their own city's burning. And I think, I think this is a guy that is very helpful to the defense. I think he's going to be very willing to see things their way. Um, if, again, I do my job as a defense attorney and I show him that the rules and regulations were being followed and nothing you saw on that tape is, is outside of what he was being taught. So you can't convict him if he's doing what he's being taught. You know, so, you know, he's, he's tough. And, you know, I think it's important. What I was going to say was I think it's so important that viewers are able to see this. They're getting to understand who the folks are on the jury. And so that'll help them understand how these decisions are getting made. These are not people who are thinking like you and me or perhaps some other folks. These are people who have their own way of looking at things. Yeah, he also visited the scene, 38th and Chicago, and didn't see the video. Right. <laughs> yeah, you see, like, hey, maybe I should check that video out if I have 30 seconds. Uh, juror four was bounced, and um, was, this was another um, for a, a, a challenge. Uh, there was a thought there, too, that he could have been for cause. Turns out the state issued a Batson challenge. They thought because he was of color, second Hispanic to get um, struck from the defense, they launched this challenge. Julie, but the judge, Judge Kale says, no, uh, I was sitting up here on the bench and I'm thinking, oh gosh, they're gonna, they're gonna whack him. Right, right, they, they jumped the gun. Bottom line, the state jumped the gun with that. And, and, you know, and that's tough, too, because if, if you start with that, then the next time you raise it, and maybe it is on legitimate grounds, then the judge might be a little bit like, okay, you keep doing this. You keep, I mean, look, okay, so Batson, this is all about preventing people from using those strikes for discriminatory reasons. When you have those strikes or those peremptory challenges is the fancy legal term, you can strike someone for any reason under the sun. Maybe it's Oh, I don't like the way this person looked at me when I walked in the jury room. I don't like their shoes. I don't like her nail polish. Whatever it is, as long as it's legitimate and non-discriminatory. And here you had reasons for cause. Number one was lost. And then number four was a master of, you know, use of force holds. So yeah. there were reasons that were valid there, Ted. Yeah. All right. We're going to step aside and take a break. As we approach the top of the hour, when we come back, we'll have much more of our continuing coverage of the state of Minnesota versus Derek Chauvin. Julie Grant will be here at the desk. Stay with us. Right back.